Can we review a question that was on the post? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the one about um, paralysis that's caused by the cleavage of snare proteins with the toxins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And why that affects the presynaptic and postsynaptic outputs? Okay. Sure. Sure. Um, where do we find? Our snare proteins. <laughs> <laughs> and the Okay, great. So, clostridial toxins will cleave or cut apart snare proteins. Uh, if they do that, do you think they're going to facilitate the function of snare proteins or prevent the function of snare proteins? Prevent. Very good, yeah. yeah. Nothing too tricky here. Um, so our experimental setup, we have some sort of stimulating electrode here. Come on down. Here's our presynaptic neuron. There's the presynaptic site and give it some dendrites. So here's our stem. We'll deliver some electrical current. That's going to initiate an action potential that will travel on down the axon and hopefully cause vesicle release. That's going to generate some fast synaptic current, which we'll talk about today, and this postsynaptic neuron, there's its axon, who cares. Here's our recording electrode, and what we'll measure from this is probably some kind of postsynaptic current. Some excitatory postsynaptic current. Where are clostridial toxins going to act in this setup? here. So, those clostridial toxins are going to cut up snares, no more snares. What's that going to do? Decrease the uh, amount of neurotransmitter that's released. Very good. No more neurotransmitter being released. What happens here? Exactly, this should be gone. It depends on the dose that you put in and when you take your measurements, but given enough time and enough toxin, will obliterate presynaptic release and will obliterate that postsynaptic current. How does it affect the presynaptic neuron? When we deliver our electrical stimulation, is it still going to generate an action potential? Why do you say that? There we go, yeah. When we deliver our electrical stim here, we're still going to be polarized. We're still just giving this presynaptic neuron electricity. So it's still going to fire an action potential. Do we need snares to open up voltage-gated sodium channels? No. No, we didn't mention those in lecture four. Snares only came up in the last lecture. So we're not going to affect the presynaptic neuron until we hit the presynaptic site. The only thing we're going to affect then is neurotransmission. So hopefully you can derive the answer based on that. Is there anything that's still unclear on that? Because botulism is no joke. You want to understand it. Have you ever heard of Botox? <coughs> All right, well, here's what it does. That's how Botox works. A little facial paralysis, and now you look ghoulishly young. <laughs> if enough action potentials are fired, will it still release some? No, we don't have snares. No snares, no release. You'll probably get some mini events, 
about that either. No. I'll say no. I don't often like to say things so definitively, but I'll say no. Yeah. So based off the conversation that we had yesterday and the email this morning, are you saying that serotonin is only degraded in the cell? No. There's extracellular monoamine oxidase. If you answer differently, because uh, because I told you MAO is only in the cell, let me know. Okay. I'll adjust your score. That's not bad. I don't mind throwing out points. So yeah, monoamine oxidase is um, certainly within the cell, but there is extracellular monoamine oxidase. It's not often mentioned. So you'll often just hear of monoamine oxidase as seen intracellularly. But cell secreted too. You can find it outside. Okay. So hopefully we got that our snare proteins are going to be ne uh, necessary for priming our vesicles and then the actual fusion of the vesicles. If you don't have snares, you don't have vesicular release. No neurotransmission. Now, whether or not they stimulate neurotransmission or not, of course, depends on the calcium sensor here. I hope you can tell me about that. And know your GABA glutamate glutamine cycle. Do we need to review that? Or shall we dive into it? Okay, let's. So, at this point in the class, we've introduced different types of nerve cells and kind of the general overview of development. Uh, last week we established a membrane potential and then fluctuated it during the action potential. The whole purpose of that is to elicit neurotransmitter release and the whole purpose of neurotransmitter release is to stimulate some effect. That effect is going to be carried out by neurotransmitter receptors. There's two broad classes of these. There's your ionotropic uh, receptors which are just ion channels. They're ligand gated ion channels. The ligand would be the neurotransmitter and when it binds to the activation gate or the ligand binding domain, same thing. It opens the pore and we get ion movements. <coughs> we get a rapid change of membrane potential. That's their job. More long-lived changes are going to be accomplished by the metatrophic receptors. These aren't going to generate fast ion occurrence, although they can affect ion channels. It'll take them a little bit longer though, because while they have transmembrane domains, this doesn't form an ion pore. This just holds the receptor in the membrane, and these intracellular loops will allow it to interact with G proteins, and these are what's gonna actually cause the effect. We're gonna find that there's at least three different types of G proteins, we'll cover them, because you'll hear about them anytime you're dealing with the metabotropic receptor. It's going to be GS, GI, or GQ. With a couple of exceptions that we'll bring up as needed. But those are your bread and butter alpha subunits for G proteins. And then we'll see how the different neurotransmitter receptors fall into these classes and explain the activity of those neurotransmitters, whether they be excitatory neurotransmitters, inhibitory neurotransmitters, or neuromodulatory transmitters. So we'll start off with ionotropic receptors. Uh, these are what are going to generate those fast synaptic currents out in the dendrites to either excite or inhibit the postsynaptic cell. So when you hear ionotropic receptor, you want to think ion. We're moving ions. So these are ion channels. They're not leak, they're not voltage gated, instead they are ligand gated. Whenever you look at synaptic currents, you can find two different components. The first component, or the early component, is going to be mediated by ionotropic receptors. They've indicated that as the E here. What we're looking at is the postsynaptic potential, which is driven by that current, while holding the cell at different membrane potentials so we can see where they reverse. This early component we can see is inward at negative 66 millivolts when we hit negative 78, no real current. When we're more hyperpolarized than that, now it's outward. Here's where it reversed. In, nothing, out. 
no net flux. So we know we're at the reversal for whatever ion or ions this channel is conducting. Remember, at reversal potential, no net flux, no current, because there's no driving force. So we can find the reversal potential experimentally and then say which ion is mediating that current. The late component here, symbolized by the L, happens later. That's why it's not the early component. You'll see it's inward at negative 66. It's still inward at negative 78, telling you it's a different ion. It doesn't reverse until somewhere around a negative 100 millivolts. As you go more hyperpolarized than that, now it's outward. <coughs> when we plot this relationship of current or amplitude, same thing, on the Y, and the holding potential for the membrane, wherever we cross the x-axis, that's our reversal, because we had no net current. Here's the late, here's the early. Which ion do you think is mediating this early component here, since it's reversing around negative 76? Chloride. Chloride, yeah. How about this one? Potassium. Potassium. They're both inhibitory. But you can see they're acting over different time forces when we hear fast inhibitory transmission. We should be thinking chloride, and that's what we see. Now the later inhibition is probably going to be mediated by potassium channels that are under control of metabotropic receptors. So with synaptic transmission, we have two different time forces, and that's because we have two different types of receptors. That fast component is driven by ionotropic receptors. And they're pretty simple. They're just ion channels. So they have an ion pore, of course they have a selectivity filter to make them either excitatory or inhibitory. And then they have somewhere for a ligand to bind, and that ligand is usually going to turn them on. So for a, a neurotransmitter receptor, we should have a ligand binding site somewhere outside the cell. So here's our membrane, here's within the cell, here's outside, so here's the synaptic cleft. So if we go through lecture five and we spit out neurotransmitters, now here in lecture six, they're gonna bind. That's gonna pull open the ion core and ions move. They move and bring the membrane potential toward their reversal. So if we're excitatory, we're dealing with non-specific cation channels, we're inhibitory, it's probably a chloride channel. Now, of course, these receptors have no idea where they should go. They just stick wherever they can. So we're going to see a large collection of scaffolding proteins, proteins that create some sort of scaffold uh, to which neurotransmitters can stick. Here's the scaffold for nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Here's our cytoskeleton. Then there are proteins that will bind to the cytoskeleton, bind to adapters, bind to neurotransmitters. The reason we include so many proteins in this is not just to make it complicated, but to make it flexible. This way we can increase or decrease the number of neurotransmitters that can bind at the postsynaptic site by just simply modifying the scaffold. If there are fewer binding sites for neurotransmitter receptors, we'll have fewer receptors there and thus we'll have a weaker synapse. Alternatively, we can increase the size of our scaffold here, add additional binding sites, and now we can insert additional receptors to strengthen the synapse. So your scaffold here is going to form your postsynaptic density. That's just because it's on the postsynaptic site. And there's a bunch of proteins, so under an electron microscope, it's electron dense. That's all that means. It's a bunch of proteins in the postsynaptic site. The bigger your postsynaptic density, the more neurotransmitters you, or the more neurotransmitter receptors you can insert. So we can change the size of our synapse and change its strength. That allows us to create new patterns and store information or erase patterns and lose information. Now when these receptors open, they don't just conduct ions the whole time. Again, we're dealing with fast synaptic transmission. It needs to be fast. So they'll turn themselves off. The ion core is going to close slightly after it opens in what we call desensitization. We can see desensitization up here. We can see that not every receptor is going to desensitize the same. These are both glutamate receptors. 
Glue A would be the AMP receptors. Glue N are subunits of NMDA receptors. So they insert these uh, into a Xenopus embryo, so now the little frog embryo has neurotransmitter receptors. And when we spit some glutamate onto it, we can see this inward current here telling you it's excitatory. That makes sense. But notice this inward current stops abruptly and it doesn't continue even though we have glutamate available. Glutamate is most certainly bound to the receptor, but it's not conducting ions. You can think of this uh, process as kind of like um, opening some spring-loaded top to a box. It'll spring open and then gravity is going to kind of bring it back down. So when the ion pore opens, it then relaxes a bit into a slightly more stable conformation. So it conducts a bunch of ions immediately after opening, but then as it relaxes, it can conduct almost none, as is the case with amper receptors, or it can conduct just some lesser amount. And that's what we see with NMDA receptors. Notice the difference in time scale here. 500 milliseconds, 25 milliseconds. So the time scale is 20-fold longer, and we still never reach zero. Both glutamate receptors, both responsible for fast synaptic transmission, but completely different kinetics. NMDA receptors are a little bit slower, but they desensitize less rapidly. So they're going to actually conduct a greater number of ions because of that lower desensitization. As far as uh, excitatory and inhibitory, that just depends on what ions we conduct. That's it. If you're conducting ions that are going to reverse above threshold potential, such as a non-specific cation channel, which should reverse around zero millivolts, or if you happen to be a sodium channel, you're going to be reversing around positive 56. These are both above threshold, and that's what makes them excitatory. We're going to depolarize, and if we hit threshold, we'll fire an action potential. The inhibitory receptors are going to use something that reverses below threshold. That's going to be chloride for ionotropic receptors. The, the way that they cause inhibition could be through some slight hyperpolarization, but hopefully we got from practicum two that you don't get a very big change in membrane potential whenever you open up chloride channels because there's not a great driving force. We're already pretty close to its reversal. What you need in order for your inhibitory transmitters to begin to do something is some excitation. We have to first depolarize a bit so we create a driving force for chloride. And that's really what it does. It resists depolarization rather than causing hyperpolarization because we're already pretty close to reversal. We have to move away from that to create a driving force. So when you're thinking inhibitory transmission, don't think about hyperpolarization, but think about shunting that excitation or preventing the excitatory currents that the cell's receiving. This is the postsynaptic potentials from an excitatory synapse without and with inhibition. Notice the decrease in amplitude. Also notice the change in timing. So the the potential is going to decay more rapidly. We're going to more quickly move back toward rest because we have that elevated chloride permeability. We're going to be dragged toward its reversal. So the excitation that the neuron receives is cut down. This is also what's going on in the relative refractory period too. Rather than being chloride, it's potassium. But it's the same idea. If we were to try to depolarize, that depolarization is reduced. It's shunted by that inhibition. And you can see here your Fi relationship, your frequency current relationship. So as we increase excitatory currents here, without inhibition, we can see we readily increase our firing rate. But there's this silent period here whenever we have inhibition because we're preventing the cell from reaching threshold. This is the big effect of inhibitory neurotransmitters. It's not really hyperpolarization because we're so close to the reversal anyway. So think about driving force, and that should make some sense to you. You need to think about driving force, too, whenever you're considering the summation of synaptic input. 
It, one synapse alone is not going to get the job done in the central nervous system, that is. Neurons have a, a much more democratic approach in the central nervous system because each synapse is very weak. No one synapse is going to bring that neuron above threshold. We take a vote. What's going on in all of my synapses? And I need the collective input from hundreds of these in order to actually reach threshold. It's a little more of a dictatorship out there in the periphery because the neuromuscular junction is so strong. It's specialized to be strong enough that that one motor neuron can depolarize the muscle cell. Not so in the central nervous system. So we are always summing synaptic input, but it rarely sums linearly. There are several reasons for that. Driving force is a big one. And this is showing us that over here. So let's, let's walk through this. This is just showing you how the driving force changes. Here's the reversal potential for that ionotropic receptor that we're stimulating at the synapse. So E sin is showing you the synaptic reversal potential. And here's where we're resting. Whenever we generate that depolarization at the synapse, notice the change in driving force. Much greater when we're at rest, but when we depolarize, of course, it decreases. So subsequent input has a slightly reduced driving force. So we get a little less current than we would expect if we were at rest. We can see that a little better down here. This is just showing you passive decay over space. Don't worry about that. Here, we're looking at two synapses along some hypothetical branch. Here's the cell body, here's the dendrite. We're going to look at synapses one and two, blue and orange. And down here, these are the postsynaptic potentials. Blue, orange, about the same height. If we were to just sum them mathematically, they would give you this dotted line. But when we sum them in actuality, they don't add up. One and one is not two in this case. One and one is something less than two. Because that second synapse had a reduced driving force. So here's what they actually did. They give you the black line. Something less than what they would have if you added them mathematically. <coughs> because that second synapse had reduced driving force. We were already a little depolarized. So the amount of current that it generated was a little less than it would have at rest. So we don't get linear summation because we're always changing the membrane potential and thus we're always changing driving force. Of course, receptors desensitize. So if you stimulate the same synapse very quickly, so if we're summing over time, well, any desensitized receptor is going to give you a reduced current, if any. So that's going to cut down your postsynaptic current as well. The fact that receptors don't have constant conductance. And then there are voltage-dependent ligand, gate, and channels. Your NMDA receptors. We'll look at this in a bit more in the, the third part of this lecture. But NMDA receptors don't conduct ions when the neuron's at rest. It has to first be depolarized because there's a magnesium ion sitting in the pool. In this case, if you're already depolarized and you open up those NMDA receptors, now one and one is greater than two. So the change in driving force can make one plus one less than two. Alternatively, opening up voltage-dependent channels can cause supralinear summation, where now you get a greater amount of depolarization than you would expect because you've unmasked some of those receptors. At rest, no NMDA receptor currents. But when depolarized first, now you get your NMDA receptor current. And that's a little more meaningful to the cell. If it's already depolarized, that tells us that two neurons, at least, have been communicating at the same time. Now we're starting to detect coincident neuronal activity and this is going to help us link together different networks so that we can associate information. Fire is hot. We can put things together because when neurons fire together, they're going to stimulate NMDA receptors and produce some change in cell function. A lot more on that in lecture 22. Uh, any questions? 
It's the same old stuff. V equals IR is still true, and here we're seeing it again. Now we're just thinking about the postsynaptic side of things. Don't forget driving force. All right. Well, let's go through these, and then we'll talk about metabotropic receptors. Uh, here's something that's usually confusing to folks. Um, so we're going to talk about just a couple of intracellular signaling pathways that are going to come up time and time again, I promise. Your GS alpha subunits and your GI, or GO, same thing, GQ alpha subunits, they always do the same thing. So learn what they do, because they always do it. It's not a, except when they don't. GS always stimulates adenyl cyclase. GI always inhibits adenyl cyclase. GQ always activates phospholipase C. If you learn that now, then later on when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, everything will make sense. Or, you know, something close to that. With metabotropic receptors, we're not just opening an ion channel. We're producing some long-lived change by modifying the function of the cell. We're modifying the activity of proteins within the cell. Those modifications are going to last longer than just simply opening an ion pore and then letting it close. So we can cause effects that last a little bit longer, like producing those late uh, synaptic currents, or a lot of bit longer. It could be days or a lifetime of change. And that's how we can learn and remember things by creating long-lived changes in cell function. So here's what it's all about. G proteins. Metabotropic receptors are G protein coupled receptors. That's exactly what it sounds like. They are receptors that are coupled to G proteins. And G proteins are proteins that bind guanine nucleotides. That's the G. Just like ATP can exist as AMP, cyclic AMP, ADP, ATP. GTP does the same thing. So it can have three phosphates, two phosphates, or one, it can be cyclic. And that's going to determine the activity state of our G proteins. When they're bound to GTP, a little higher energy, a little less stable, that dissociates the alpha subunit from the beta gamma complex. So when we're discussing G proteins, we're thinking of them as really kind of two parts. One part is free to move about the cell, only when it's bound to GTP, that's the alpha subunit. This is gonna be that GS, GI, GQ. The beta gamma complex, we tend to just think of as the same thing for every different G protein, and it sticks in the membrane. It is not free to move about the cell, but it is free to diffuse within the membrane, so anything stuck in there, like an ion channel, can be affected by our beta gamma complex. The intracellular targets are going to be targeted by the alpha subunit, and here's our two targets, adenyl cyclase and phospholipase C. These are going to produce different secondary messengers to create that long-lived change in cell function. Just like ionotropic receptors desensitize to essentially turn themselves off, our G proteins are going to turn themselves off because the alpha subunit, after it's bound to GTP, will spontaneously hydrolyze that GTP break it down into GDP. We remove a phosphate group spontaneously. When it's bound to GDP, that allows the alpha subunit to interact with the beta gamma complex, turning off the G protein. So up there at the membrane, down to the receptor, the G protein is put together. Alpha, beta gamma, all stuck together. When the receptor is bound by its ligand, that stimulates it to substitute GTP in, or that GDP, which dissociates the beta gamma complex from the alpha subunit, and this is free to move about the cell and affect its targets. This is much slower than opening an ion channel, and that's why we produce those late components of synaptic currents. So this potassium component here is most likely driven by the beta gamma complex, using around the membrane and opening up potassium channels. There are G-protein regulated inward rectifying potassium channels 
They're called GERP channels. And that's probably what's mediating this. The first target that we're going to talk about is adenylocyclase. This is going to create cyclic adenine. So cyclic AMP. We'll turn ATP into cyclic AMP. That's the function that adenylyl or adenylate cyclase, same thing, is going to catalyze. We have GS and GI alpha subunits. That letter tells you what it's doing. S is going to stimulate this enzyme and thus increase levels of cyclic AMP. GI or GO, same thing. Thinking GI is better because I inhibits. They're both targeting the same enzyme, but they're doing opposite things. S is going to increase the activity. I is going to decrease the activity. So GS coupled receptors will increase cyclic AMP levels. That cyclic AMP is then going to affect the activity of other proteins. Those could be ion channels. These will come up, again, cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels. And they're exactly what they sound like. They're cation channels, so are they excitatory or inhibitory? Fantastic. And they're gated by cyclic nucleotides, like cyclic AMP. So a GS coupled receptor is going to increase the excitability of nerve cells by increasing cyclic AMP levels and then increasing ion conductance through these cation channels here. GI, on the other hand, drops cyclic AMP levels and thus decreases conductance there, making the neuron less excitable. <coughs> but that's not all. Cyclic AMP can then act on other targets besides ion channels to produce other changes in cell function. The principal target here would be protein kinase A, where cyclic AMP binding removes this inhibitory regula uh, regulatory domain, and now this kinase can do what it does, which is phosphorylate targets. Depending on the target, that's going to determine what's the outcome. Protein kinase A could increase or decrease the excitability of neurons. It really just depends on where we're sticking that protein kinase and what targets it has available to it. It can only phosphorylate the protein if it bumps into it. So different cells will allow different interactions between protein kinase A and its targets, making it excitatory in some cells and inhibitory in others. Like any kinase, we're going to be adding phosphate groups. Phosphate groups occupy space. They also carry a charge with them. So that's going to affect how proteins fold up. Structure is function. When you modify how the protein folds, you can hide or expose binding sites. <coughs> you can modify the shape of an ion pore and affect conductance through that channel. So you can dramatically change the function of a protein after translation. That's what a post-translational modification is. We've already made the protein, and now we can quickly turn it on or off or vice versa. Sometimes phosphorylation turns on a protein, sometimes it turns it off. You simply have to know. You actually have to gather the data and find out what it does. So I'll tell you, or you'll go read about it. Because it could, in theory, do anything, depending on where you phosphorylate. So one of the targets of protein kinase A would be voltage-gated sodium channels. We've heard of those before. When protein kinase A phosphorylates voltage-gated sodium channels, their conductance decreases. So here they've just applied exogenous protein kinase A, waited 20 minutes, and noticed the difference in that conductance. It's dropped, and if you were to plot that over time, you'd see in the presence of protein kinase A, your sodium currents drop, so the cell is a little less excitable. If this reaction is allowed to happen, protein kinase A makes your cell a little less excitable. Not every cell does this. Another potential target would be AMPA receptors. And we'll hear about this again in lecture 22. When protein kinase A is active, it stimulates insertion of AMPA receptors. Now you have additional glutamate receptors. In the synapse, you have a stronger synapse. You've learned something. Excellent. You can produce much longer lived changes in cell function by modifying gene expression. 
in addition to phosphorylating ion channels, protein kinase A can also phosphorylate transcription factors. That's the science way of saying things that affect transcription. We're going to modify gene expression. And that gene expression seems tied to the ability to learn because we're affecting the expression of glutamate receptors and synaptic proteins. So the amount of CREB activity is related to the number of synapses, the strength of synapses, and the ability to learn. Let's have a look here to see if that's the case. The y-axis here is showing you the escape latency, how long it took for a rodent to find a platform in the Morris water maze. Rodents don't like to swim, so they want to find this platform to get out of the water. The open circles here are showing you just regular rodents, nothing wrong with them, and we can see that escape latency decreases over the course of the experiment. So that would be at one, two, three, four, and five days. Notice the escape latency is dropping. We're learning where the platform is, and so we can get out of the water faster. They're remembering the location of it. These filled circles are showing you Krebs binding protein knockout mice. Krebs binding protein is necessary for Krebs to function. So these mice have reduced Krebs activity and reduced learning. Coinciding that, they also have a reduction in NMDA receptor subunit expression, AMPA receptor expression, so in other words, glutamate receptors. We're making fewer of those. PSD95, one of those components of the postsynaptic density, suggesting that they have either smaller or fewer synapses, or both. And then SYNGAP here, this is um, a protein that's going to link synapses together. So it's going to link the pre- and postsynaptic sites so they stay very close to one another. Of course, they only stay in place if they're held in place, and this is one of the proteins that does it. Again, reduce levels of that, indicating fewer synapses, which makes sense. They didn't learn as readily. They didn't have as many uh, sites of information storage. Notice we're affecting the organism not over the scale of milliseconds here, but days. Much longer lived effects when we're affecting gene expression. So your metabotropic receptors, while they're a little slower and a little more complicated, they can produce very meaningful changes in cell function. Uh, the other target is phospholipase C. So this brings us to our last alpha subunit, GQ. That's going to stimulate phospholipase C, and that's an enzyme that's going to cleave phospholipids. So this makes sense. We're going to cut it at a different site than phospholipase A or B or D. So there's different places you can cut phospholipids. The C is just telling you where that is. And that location happens to, happens to be between the diacylglycerol and the inositol triphosphate of phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. There it is. You don't have to say all that. You can say PIP2. That's fine. <laughs> That works. This is just a phospholipid. It's a, it's a component of the membrane that enzymes can cut and liberate little soluble components. Here's a little, essentially a sugar derivative. Inositol triphosphate, IP3. This is going to float around in the cell because it's water soluble. It's cut off of the membrane. And it's going to bump into IP3 receptors on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The IP3 receptor is the receptor for IP3. Nothing tricky here. It's also a calcium channel. And the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a big intracellular sac of calcium. Hopefully we remember that the presynaptic site has smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It helps buffer calcium. This is true all throughout the cell. Your smooth ER buffers calcium. So when you open up calcium channels on that smooth ER, calcium leaves. Massive driving force for calcium. Huge concentration gradient here. We keep intracellular levels very low in the cytoplasm anyway because we're stuffing all of our calcium in the mitochondria to smooth the arc. Open up your IP3 receptors, calcium comes out. That can further stimulate calcium release through reanidine receptors, which have a binding site for calcium. And when calcium binds, they open in more calcium release, giving you a big calcium spike. So when we're thinking GQ, it's all about calcium, not cyclic AMP. Calcium is another secondary messenger that's going to affect the activity of kinases and phosphatases, just like cyclic AMP. It's just going to have a different 
set of kinases and phosphatases that it'll act on. It can also stimulate adenyl cyclase, but it does have some unique targets. Cam kinase 2, protein kinase C, which is also going to be dependent on diacylglycerol. But here's a couple kinases, and they're going to do exactly what protein kinase A does. They're going to phosphorylate their targets. They'll have some distinct targets, and they'll have some overlap. They can phosphorylate AMP receptors to increase their conductance rather than abundance. Increase their conductance, go back to V equals IR, and you'll see you're going to get a stronger excitatory current. You'll have a stronger synapse. Or you can act through CREB yet again. Cam kinase 2 will phosphorylate CREB to affect CREB dependent gene expression, just like we saw in the last slide, to produce a much longer lived change in function. Cam kinase 2 knockouts also suffer from learning deficits as well. So there's a few distinctions here between them, but there's also overlap in the end. They can both affect gene expression. They're both using G proteins, one's GQ, the other's GS. They're going to create a secondary messenger. One is cyclic AMP, this one happens to be calcium. But that's it. Do we have any questions? Let's take a moment and talk about these. Make sure you have a little list. GS, GI, GQ. Know their targets. Know what they do and you'll know how they affect cells. <clears throat> because there isn't just one type of receptor for each of these transmitters. There's at least two types for all of them. And of those two types, they're going to have different subunits that can make them up, that are going to give them all their own unique properties in terms of their kinetics, the degree to which the ligand binds, the pharmacology of them, which drugs affect them. There's a bunch of different receptors out there, even just for glutamate. So anytime we're talking about neuro neurotransmitters, we have to appreciate that there are multiple receptors. And you have to know the receptor that we're talking about. You have to know which receptors are present at certain synapses to understand the effect of that neurotransmitter. Do we have the inhibitory versions there or, or the excitatory? Now, of course, when we're talking glutamate, we're thinking it's excitatory, and that's almost always true. It's certainly true for the ionotropic receptors, no doubt about that. There is no except when it's not. AMPA receptors and NDA receptors, kinase receptors, which always get brushed under the rug, and we will again, they're all cation channels. Mm -hmm. The AMP receptors are responsible for fast synaptic transmission because you can open them at resting membrane potentials, there's no magnesium block, and they quickly desensitize. That allows for just regular old run-of-the-mill fast excitation. The NMDA receptors down here, well, they're a little bit different. They have a magnesium ion that sits in their ion pore. And only when the cell is depolarized enough to kick out that magnesium ion, when it's not negative enough to attract that magnesium ion <coughs> to the pore, in other words, then we've unblocked our pore. So that's kind of like the inactivation gate for our NMDA receptors. And it makes them voltage gated, which is kind of nifty. So they're both voltage and ligand gated ion channels. We can see that voltage dependence here. The x-axis, this is like what we saw earlier for the fast and, and late components. We're holding the cell at different membrane potentials. Positive 40, 20, 0, minus 20, 40, 60, 80. By holding the cell at different membrane potentials, we can measure the current that we get when we apply glutamate to these receptors. Your AMPA receptors are shown as these circles here. Notice the nice linear relationship. They both reverse at zero, suggesting that they are non-specific cation channels. No major difference there. As you become more positive, you get a greater outward current as a result. No surprise there. What gets surprising is down here at the negative potentials. Your amp receptor is going to give you stronger inward currents the more negative you get because we're increasing the driving force. And that's true for a little bit with NMDA receptors, but we quickly see that it has this J-shaped curve because of that magnesium block. When we're more negatively charged, 
that's going to pull magnesium into the core and block it. Magnesium is a little too big to move through it, so it just sits there in the way. Only a slightly depolarized cell will have NMDA currents blocked over here. Despite having sufficient driving force, it doesn't have the conductance needed to generate the strong current that we get with amper receptors. So there's your voltage dependence right there. If the cell is resting or hyperpolarized, no NMDA current. We want to control those NMDA currents because they don't desensitize. You're going to be moving a much greater number of ions when you have NMDA receptors activated because there's no desensitization. One of the ions that they move uh, would be calcium. So calcium, you're going to get a big calcium spike through NMDA receptors, not so much with AMPA. Some of them are calcium impermeable. Most aren't. But they rapidly desensitize. Look at the area under the curve for your AMPA component and your NMDA component. NMDA receptors move more ions. Well, as a result, you're going to have to pump all those ions back. So they're a little more costly to the cell, but it's worth it because they'll produce long-lived changes in cell function by bringing in enough calcium to activate those targets of calcium. You're bringing in a secondary messenger here. So stimulation of NMDA receptors, which only occurs when the cell is already depolarized, is going to stimulate some change in synapse function. We'll see what that is later on. There's also metabotropic glutamate receptors as well. It's not just an ionotropic receptor here. And here's where it gets a little tricky. You need to know the type of metabotropic glutamate receptor because there's not just one. There are several which we put into three different groups. You'll notice they all have their different numbers. MGLUR1 and 5 would be group, group 1, found postsynaptically, and they're excitatory. You see a mix of GQ and GS coupling. And receptors can switch their alpha subunit that they're coupled to as well. It gets a little more complicated. But both of these are excitatory in neurons, for sure. Increased calcium, that's going to excite a neuron. Increased cyclic AMP and open up cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels, that's going to excite a neuron too. Pretty straightforward there, we're still excitatory. Group 2 and 3 are inhibitory, and they're found on presynaptic and postsynaptic sites, allowing glutamate to inhibit neurons, particularly if it starts to escape a bit and hit these more peripherally located metabotropic receptors. But it acts as an autoreceptor too. So our group 2 and blue R's are predominantly at presynaptic sites. Of course, these mix it up. They can be found at postsynaptic as well. But they're GI coupled. They're going to decrease cyclic AMP levels and thus decrease the excitability of neurons. So that if this uh, neuron is spitting out a bunch of glutamate and it starts to bind to these presynaptic receptors, that's going to tone down, or, or sorry, that's going to turn down the excitability of that presynaptic site. So we stop spitting out as much glutamate. So if we spit out too much glutamate or very high levels of it, that turns itself off to prevent excitotoxicity. So built-in negative feedback loops. You'll find these in any signaling pathway, at least any that are uh, responsible. GABA receptors, glycine receptors, these are the inhibitory uh, receptors there. Uh, the ionotropic receptors are going to be chloride channels. There's different distribution there. We'll talk a little bit more about GABA receptors. They're a lot more widely studied. So there's GABA A, which is your ionotropic and GABA B, which is metabotropic. Still inhibitory, so that's good. It's a little simpler when we're talking about GABA. It's almost never excitatory, except in development. But after you're developed, GABA is inhibitory. Both GABA A and GABA B, one's quickly inhibitory, and one produces more long-lived inhibition. Mostly what's going to go on here is going to be the beta-gamma complex, activating those passing channels. For GABA-A receptors, we're just generating a chloride current that's going to inhibit the activity of the neuron. Now, there are a few different uh, drugs that can target GABA-A receptors, your benzodiazepines, as we already mentioned, but also ethanol. 
Ethanol is going to inhibit neurons by uh, potentiating currents through GABA-A receptors. And we can see that up here. So when they deliver a depolarizing current, we get a certain number of action potentials. Base some ethanol on the neuron, fewer action potentials. Get rid of the ethanol, we're back to baseline. So we just increase GABA receptor activity here. Ethanol does nothing in the presence of picrotoxin. Picrotoxin blocks GABA-A receptors. So this is going to cause uh, an increase in neural excitability. It can actually cause excitotoxicity. That's why it's called picrotoxin. This is toxic. Yeah. Well, where is that from? This picrotoxin. Picrotoxin? Ooh, I don't know. It's either a plant or some weird uh, bug. I don't know. So if you get bit by it, you don't get drunk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you probably have some paralysis because of uh, hyperactivity of neurons, and they probably die. Okay. Yeah. We don't. So you don't get drunk. We don't use. No, you won't get drunk. <laughs> no, and you might not breathe either. You have bigger problems than drinking there. Um, I don't know what makes it. That's a great question. I should know. I should know that. Um, acetylcholine also has ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. We've probably heard of nicotinic receptors before. That's what we find at the neuromuscular junction. They're also in the central nervous system, but they are um, mostly localized on presynaptic sites. So when we're thinking acetylcholine, we, we should bias ourselves more toward the peripheral nervous system. It does act centrally, but it, it certainly acts all throughout the body at neuromuscular junctions and also in the autonomic nervous system. So we're going to find different types of muscarinic receptors, some of which are going to be excitatory. All the odd numbers are GQ coupled. All the even numbers, GI. So we're going to increase calcium. We're going to decrease cyclic AMP. These are going to have different effects. And of course it depends on the target what effect that's going to have. What we can see here, we can stimulate different intracellular signaling pathways and thus have dramatically different effects on the target. Are we going to excite by stimulating the release of intracellular calcium into the cytoplasm? Or are we going to decrease cyclic AMP levels and perhaps lower pacemaking at the heart, for example? And it depends. It depends on what kind of receptors you have there. If they had M1, 3, or 5 at the heart, well, your parasympathetic nervous system would actually increase heart rate. But they don't, so it doesn't. You do need to know the receptor, and you need to know the coupling. Only then does the neurotransmitter effect make any sense. Uh, dopamine is also going to have excitatory and inhibitory receptors here, but they're metabotropic. No ionotropic dopamine receptor. And that's why we call it a neuromodulatory transmitter. It doesn't generate fast synaptic currents. It generates those slow, long-lived currents. Two general classes. Uh, there's at least five subtypes, but we put them into two classes. The D1 class are excitatory because they're GS coupled. D2, inhibitory because they're GI coupled. We're looking at the pacemaking of a dopamine neuron here. When you spit dopamine out onto a dopamine neuron, that inhibits it. Because dopamine neurons have D2 receptors a lot more than they have D1. So they have a greater proportion of D2. And that allows them to turn themselves off if they're hyperactive. Again, negative feedback. You want to see this. This tells you that we're a safe and responsible signaling pathway. If they turn themselves on, like voltage-gated sodium channels, for example, well, they could potentially kill themselves. They lead to excitotoxicity, but they don't because they have D2, and we all know that's GI. That's going to be inhibitory. And we can see here the inhibition by dopamine. Notice the pause in their firing that occurs after we spit dopamine onto that neuron. And we know that it's caused by D2 receptors because if you apply a D2-specific agonist, like quinprol, you see the same thing. Here's our pause after we stimulate D2 receptors. And that's because D2 receptors are GI coupled. We're over here. We're going to inhibit adenylyl cyclase, which decreases cyclic AMP levels. 
which decreases the conductance through these cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels. You decrease the cation conductance. Thus, you make the neuron less excitable. Cells that have D1 receptors, well, those are GS coupled. Sure, they both bind dopamine, but they have different G proteins on the inside. So this one stimulates adenylocyclase. Cyclic AMP levels increase. Notice the font is bigger. There's more of it. So it's going to stimulate those cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels. We should have greater cation influx. Thus, we're excited. These are going to come up again when we talk about the basal ganglia. That's going to be why the direct and indirect pathways are going to be affected differently by dopamine. You can't wait, can you? You're going to have to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll get there. It's coming. <clears throat> Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is also a neuromodulatory transmitter because it acts on G-protein coupled receptors. Much like dopamine, there are discrete sites of these neuromodulatory neurons. They're down there in the brainstem. They project all throughout, and they're going to produce long-lived changes depending on which receptor we have present. You might find this table useful, especially whenever we're talking about the autonomic nervous system because norepinephrine is going to be released from our sympathetic postganglionic neurons. Now, how do they affect the target tissue? Well, it depends. What receptor do you have? Do you have alpha-1? Well, you're going to be stimulated. No doubt about it, because we're going to increase calcium levels. Whether you're smooth, striated muscle, a neuron, doesn't matter. That's exciting. Alpha-2. Well, that's GI. That's probably going to be inhibitory. Certainly in neurons, so those presynaptic autoreceptors, that's going to allow norepinephrine to turn itself off. If it's spitting out a high level of norepinephrine, it'll bind to the presynaptic A2 receptors, and that'll inhibit release at that site. Beta receptors, now there's one or two, those are GS. So those are going to be excitatory unless you're smooth muscle, then things are a little different. We'll talk about that later. But if you know the coupling to that receptor and you know what receptor is there, you know what the effect of that neurotransmitter is going to be. Why, why does noradrenaline increase heart rate? Well, because the heart has beta receptors. They don't have alpha-2. If they had alpha-2, it would be inhibitory, but they don't, so it's not. They have beta, so GS, so it stimulates. We're going to increase cyclic nucleotide levels and the cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels there in the pacemakers are going to make them more excited. So if you know the coupling, it really does make sense. And there's only three things to learn. That's not that much. It's less than a handful. Serotonin. Same idea. Slight difference here. There are some cation channels. This makes it a little complicated. But they're rare. So you can probably forget about them. I doubt I'm going to ask anything about them. But then we have different types that can be inhibitory or excitatory because the 5-HT, which is 5-hydroxytryptophan, uh, which is serotonin. So 5-HT is serotonin. Serotonin 1, GI, inhibitory. 5-HT2, GQ, excitatory. Because it's going to increase calcium. It's going to make the neuron more excitable. GI is going to decrease cyclic AMP levels. We're going to decrease that cation conductance. We're going to be less excitable. Nothing too tricky there. Histamine is a neurotransmitter that uh, is released from a very small number of neurons in the tuberal mammillary nucleus, so down there in the hypothalamus. But they have very important effects. For the most part, histamine is going to be excitatory because most of the receptors are going to be either GQ or GS coupled. But again, it kind of depends. This one isn't clear. It appears to be both GS and GQ. Then there's the, the inhibitory autoreceptors. It's just that negative feedback. So histaminergic neurons can turn themselves off if they're overly excited. But down here in your hypothalamus, in the tuberal mammillary nucleus, histaminergic neurons project all over your nervous system, most importantly to your cortex where the magic happens, where you create consciousness. 
and they promote wakefulness. They promote wakefulness by acting on excitatory histaminergic transmitters. And that's what we can see here. Histamine is excitatory, of course, over a very long period of time, because these aren't ionotropic receptors, they're metabotropic. Here's the control firing of uh, a neuron in the substantia nigra. So just any old neuron. It's somewhat close to the tuberal mammillary nucleus, so it's easy to keep those connections intact. Same thing is true for the cortex, though. You apply some histamine and have a look. How'd the firing rate change? Well, we can see it over time here. Apply histamine, firing rate increases. Block histamine receptors, decreases. So by stimulating the H1, or GQ coupled receptor, we're gonna bump up calcium levels and make that neuron more excitable, and it's gonna fire action potentials at a higher frequency. And this helps keep us awake, which of course the old school first generation antihistamines demonstrate very well. There's drowsy and non-drowsy. Non-drowsy ones just don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so they affect peripheral histamine receptors to help prevent that allergic reaction. But they don't put you to sleep. If you want a good night's sleep, you take the old-fashioned ones that do cross the blood-brain barrier. And that excitatory drive from histamine gets inhibited. So your cortical neurons become less excitable, you don't create your consciousness anymore, and you fall asleep. It's a wonderful thing when you're sick. And that wouldn't make any sense at all if you didn't know this. And of course, this wouldn't make any sense at all if you didn't pay attention to the second part of this talk. But you did. So everything makes sense now. <laughs> so get out there and be somebody. We got about five minutes. Do we have questions? It's all pretty straightforward. There's three things to learn. GS, GI, GQ. It's not the stylish one, that's the calcium one. Make a list. At least act like it's not a good list. Make a list. What's the target? What does that target make? How does that thing that it makes affect the cell? And you'll be ready. You'll be ready for exam one, two, three, four. They're going to come up again? I think so. All right, let's see if we can answer these. If anything is particularly troubling, let me know. We'll chat about it. And then we'll call it a class.